The following is a presentation of Project Independence and WCWP. Project Independence is the Aging in Place initiative of the town of North Hempstead. Welcome to Project Independence and You. Good morning and welcome to Project Independence and You, 88.1 FM and WC. WP.org. I'm Rebecca Miller, along with Otto Lose, Christina Liu, and Dan Cox. And our guest today is Karen Michike. And Karen Michike is the Executive Director of Literacy Nassau. And we're going to be talking all about lit Literacy Nassau and also a little bit about Karen. Very interesting. And she's actually in the process of um, completing or she finished her first novel. So very exciting stuff. And we're so happy that you're here today with us. Um, so welcome. And um, really want to hear a little bit. I know that you've been on the show before, but, um, you know, we have a lot more listeners now and we reach out um, through North Hempstead Television and YouTube and all kinds of other way other mediums so um it's it's a little we reach more people now so just could you tell us a little bit about literacy nassau sure well first of all thank you so much for having me on the show i really appreciate it it has been probably like five or six years since i've done this with you guys so yes a lot has changed um literacy nassau is a fabulous organization that i'm so proud to spearhead um it has been in existence since 1968 um, and it was founded on the idea of the literacy volunteers model where, you know, folks in the community can serve others in the community who are at the lowest levels of literacy. And so we train them and we deploy them out um, to libraries mostly to work with the adult population. And of course, over time, that's shifted. So where it used to be basic learners who were folks who were born in America and who could speak and listen to English but could not read or write. That population has significantly shifted over to mostly English language learners. Um, and then, of course, we also do lots of other stuff. We work with adults with developmental disabilities. Um, we do some stuff with citizenship. Um, and most recently, we have a very robust program for children who have dyslexia. Um, that is a donation-based tutoring program here at our center. So we're doing lots of great stuff in the community. Of all those programs, which is the one that you do the most or get most people actively engaged with you? So that's a really interesting question. It, I used I would have said six years ago on this exact show that um, the biggest was our ESL program for sure. But now that we're working with kids, I'd say it's a very even split. From the volunteer standpoint and from a project independence standpoint, it remains working with adults, particularly um, those who are English language learners and or those with developmental disabilities. But from a, um, an, a public interest standpoint and you know what's really trending right now, um, the work we're doing with children is very, very um, timely and relevant. And it kind of aligns with um, like legislation in the state and things like that. So it's really important work. You know, last night on one of the news segments, I saw a segment, there was a doctor in Boston who goes around and visits homely, homeless people twice a week at night. That. And he tries to do what he can do for them. And an interesting number that he brought up is that he says he estimates that 25% of the homeless people are in a category where they can't read or write. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's kind of hit a nerve for me because I knew we were going to be on today. And it really points out that the earlier you start with people mm -hmm. with the learning of reading and writing connected to it, uh, the more important it is for them when they get older. Uh, That's extremely, extremely true. And I can only speak from personal experience um, as to why I decided to start the program for children. But so dyslexia is hereditary and it's also extremely common, Otto. So you're right to say about 25 percent. The stats I've heard are mostly like one in five, so about 20 percent. But um, it's extremely common, this learning disability. And because it's hidden, you can't really see it in folks in a, in a school setting. Right. So a child who's in the second grade you know, may not be able to read, but 
could be misperceived as lazy or, you know, class clown or like all of these other things that are really compensatory efforts on the part of the child to not get called on or to not, um, you know, have to have the spotlight on them. But as I said, I can only speak from personal experience. So my mom, who is about to be 80, I'm sure she'll love that I'm sharing that. Thankfully, <laughs> in North Memphis, we won't tell anyone. She shouldn't be seeing it. She's out in Babylon. It's a good thing. It's a good um, thing. It is. She has dyslexia. And um, when I started here at Literacy Nassau in 2000, um, she wanted to learn how to read um, and, and spell significantly better than she was able to for her entire adult life. So this was when she was in her late 60s. And I got pregnant with my first child in 2011. And that was the point at which I had been at the organization for a little while. I got to know kind of like the lay of the land and I felt like I could make her a student. So she worked with a tutor of ours for over a year who significantly helped her um, to learn to read. The reason she wanted to do it at that time was because I was pregnant. Like I said, she just wanted to be able to read to her grandkids, right? And so now fast forward all this time, both of her grandchildren, two, my two little girls, you can see pictures in the background, both have dyslexia and I don't. So it skipped my generation and both of them have it. When they were younger, I noticed in my older daughter, there were some things that would come up with rhyming and speech and things that are very early indicators of literacy ability. And I said, I'm pretty sure that this child has dyslexia. And what am I going to do about it as her mom? Could you just um, mention what those kind of signs were that you noticed? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, she would memorize my phone number and then write out every digit backwards and write it from right to left instead of left to right. Um, So directionality is a huge piece of it. Um, Her rhyming skills were not that great. Um, That's phonology and phonemic awareness. And so like, if you can't figure out that at and bat and cat are all living in the same word family and that doesn't resonate, then that could be a sign. Um, Other little things too, like some speech issues, the R's and the L's were like impossible for a very long time. And there's a lot of discrepancy between R's and L's in the sound production in the mouth, but also um, almost all basic blends are R and L blends right? Like cl, cur, bull, burr, like all the, for little words when you're starting out to teach a young child, lots of L and R blends. So that was an issue. Um, Anyway, I realized there was an issue. I approached a funder of mine who has been a major donor with us for a very long time. And I said, I really would like to remediate this not only for my children, but I would like to remediate this for Long Island because I see what has happened with my mom. I see all that she can't do as a grown woman. She can't drive because she can't read the signs fast enough. She could never drive. She was never really able to work. And granted, it was a different time when she was younger and work was not as much of a thing when I was growing up. Like moms could stay home and be okay. Um, But then, you know, as time went on, she wanted to work and it was very, very hard for her to find a job. She can't email she, she has a tough time with the internet and any kind of digital literacy. And I said, I can't in good conscience know that I'm raising kids who are going to suffer any of these same plights. So I wanted to do everything I could to learn. And so I found the Orton Gillingham Academy, which is like the gold standard for teaching children with dyslexia how to read or people with dyslexia how to read. And I received a grant of a million dollars over eight years, which is enabling our center to become like the cornerstone for literacy training in the region. Um, And we're the only center that I know of in the country that is doing donation-based tutoring because this tutoring is very expensive because it's such specialized training. And it's an eight-year grant because it takes eight years to become a fellow of the Orton Gillingham Academy. So it's like getting a doctorate times two. Um, And the reason it takes so long is because there's so much to learn. But once you're a fellow of the academy, you can train and certify others. So I'm positioning the organization so that we can go out and provide this training to teachers and schools. You know, in reading for this, you mentioned uh, somewhere in the material, Orton Gillingham method. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is that... uh, unique or is that, you know, I know nothing about it, to be honest with you. So it's nothing that's new. It actually was uh, derived over a hundred years ago by Samuel Orton, who was a brain doctor, a neuropsychologist and Anna Gillingham, who was an educator. But what it is, is it's an approach. And so it's not a program. If you send your child to school and your child has, you know, any kind of resource room or such such you know thing like that where they're getting extra help they're going to 
the teachers are going to deliver a box curriculum. And from school to school, from district to district, that can vary, right? Orton-Gillingham is an approach that is diagnostic and prescriptive. So that means that if I'm your child's teacher of reading, I am going to work with them one-on-one in a multi-sensory environment, which means that if you are learning to spell out a word, you're going to say it and hear it and write it and tap it and do all of the things at the same time so that you're engaging all of your senses. And then today's lesson that I plan for you is going to be based on errors that you made yesterday. So it's not following a box curriculum. The journey is going to vary from one child to the next traumatic, dramatically, not traumatically, <laughs> um, dramatically, because obviously, you know, each child is different and each brain is different. And that's why Orton Gillingham is so highly specialized and also so expensive because it's a teacher who every single time they meet with the child is creating a lesson plan specifically for that child for that day. So. Now, I, I, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to ask about like um, comparing or the differences of an adult who maybe did not know they were dyslexic earlier in life, but it has come to light older as an older person. Um, versus a younger person where it's caught earlier. What, what's, it, what's it like for an older person? I mean, what's, I wanna say, what's the motivation? If someone realizes it, is it worth it? I mean, I, I definitely think it's worth it, you know, 100%. But, you know, some people may be like, at that point, you know, why, why even bother? But, um, you know, what are the results like for someone who is dyslexic um, to kind of overcome it or learn different methods? Yeah. So this is a two part question, really. Right. Like the first part is like, what's the difference between teaching an older and a younger student? And the second part is what are the implications of dyslexia when you become an older person? So I'll speak to that side first. The implications of dyslexia on the more you grow is massive social anxiety. Right. And so that I can say pretty fairly across the board. Imagine walking into a restaurant with a group of adults and you're going to go and have dinner and you can't read the menu. How do you order? You don't want to tell everybody, well, I can't read this. So will someone read this to me? Right. You're going to listen to the specials carefully to hear what what is said. You're going to listen to what your friends are ordering. And then probably you're going to just say, oh, I'll have what what she said. I'll, I'll have that. Right. Right. Because you can't decipher it yourself. That's such an anxiety provoking situation for something that all of us just take for granted. Right. I go to the restaurant. I read the menu. I decide what I want. And I say what I want. That's it. Right. So the social anxiety that comes from having dyslexia as an adult is tremendous because reading is something that we are expected to do when we're kids. Right. And if you don't know how to read as an adult, people you assume people will think that you're stupid, that you're incompetent, that like all of these things. Right. And that's going to make you feel a certain way about yourself. So the confidence is lagging and all sorts of things happen as a result. And that's why it's so important to remediate dyslexia in children, because it is not it's not a solvable problem, but it is something that can be remediated. And then the more you use the skills you learn and the strategies that you learn, the more you're able to create this compensatory um, effort that translates into the capacity to read and spell, right? You'll still be a little maybe slower than others or, you Mm -hmm. know, but the reason we want to train children is because the brain, this is the second part of your question. The brain is significantly more neuroplastic when you are younger than it is when you are older. So children that are, you know, between ages like three and eight are like the prime suspects for us, right? Because we can still manipulate their brains. We can still myelinate new neural pathways. And so without trying to make myself sound like I'm some sort of brain person, because I'm really not, um, <laughs> that's that's basically the reason that it's important to do it for kids when they're younger, because then you can change the whole trajectory of their life by teaching them this skill that's so integral to every right. piece of every aspect of life, right, is going to be credited to whether or not you can read. So do, do you think the general public uh, may not have enough knowledge about this and that there could be because of that a stigma connected to it? Like if somebody yes. hears, oh, you have dyslexia or she does or he does, uh, I, I could see by the faces of some people that they think that this is like uh, like you used the words earlier about, oh, you're stupid or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, and I would believe that you also have to get involved with that part of it, you know, that people uh, can overcome the mental part of 
Mm -hmm. the stigma connected to it, which there is a fact, I think there is a stigma. Uh, how, how do you go about that? Is that all during the process or? Yes. So every Orton Gillingham lesson is designed to be an experience of success, right? And so if you are a child and you come here to my center and I work with you for an hour, right? And you leave having done the work and understanding it and feeling like, that wasn't so hard. That was okay, right? Then you'll be more self-motivated intrinsically to come back the next time thinking, well, it wasn't as bad as it is in school. I didn't feel stupid. I felt okay. And part of our charge as practitioners is to meet the child where they are and find things that are going to interest and excite them. So for example, I work with a little girl Monday through Thursday, and every Thursday is baking day. And the reason it's baking day is because she loves to cook. This is the thing that she likes to do, I have a kitchen here. She meets me here at my office. So we go and we cook on Thursdays and we always try and make something that's going to illustrate the thing we've learned, you know, that week, the topics we're working on. So last week we, or two weeks ago, we were working on um, the bossy R. The letter R is uh, a controlling consonant. It is jealous of all the vowels. The vowels can say their names and the R cannot. And so when an R comes after a vowel, it makes the vowel say some version of R. A-R says R, E-R, I-R, and U-R say er, and O-R says or, right? So we teach it as the R is very jealous of the vowels. Fine. So that week for her little baking project, we made dirt cups, which are essentially Oreos and pudding and like graham crackers and whatever. And you smash it all up and you put some worms in it. Right. And a whole lesson was created around these dirt cups to bring to life. We're going to read this recipe. It's got the bossy R in it. Let's underline all of the, all the bossy R's that we see. And then we make this lovely thing that she can take home for her family. So that's an example. All right. Well, um, we're at perfect timing because we're going to go to a quick break. You're listening to Project Independence in You, Community Talk Radio on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. And we will be right back with Karen Michite, who is the Executive Director of Literacy Nassau. WCWP is your home for great music and great conversation. You'll find all that and more on WCWP.org. Listen live on the web, check out the lineup, subscribe to podcasts, and stay up to date on the latest station events. Get in touch with us and let us know if you like what you're hearing. And find out how you can support or get involved at the only community public radio station serving Nassau's North Shore. Plus, sign up to get a free bumper sticker. It's all online at WCWP.org. And welcome back to Project Independence in You, Community Talk Radio on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. I am Rebecca Miller, along with Otto Lose, Christina Liu, of course, who is the radio show producer, and director Dan Cox. And we've been speaking with Karen Michike, who um, we're learning a lot about Literacy Nassau. Um, and before break, we're talking talking about the differences of course our listeners are for the most part older adults but a lot of what you're saying you know i don't want to say makes sense but it does like why things are a little bit more difficult when for an older person because you hear all the time you know the time for people to learn a second language say is always when they're younger and it makes sense because that's when they're still building those neural pathways and it's still there and as we get older those aren't as available so it takes a little bit longer and i'm sure different techniques that you know that are involved but um it's very interesting uh, this is a very interesting program and I like that over the years, you've grown and changed to become, I want to say more progressive, but in a sense, yes. And um, if anybody's listening, you know, and a, and a lot of our listeners are also grandparents and they and may even be caretakers to their children. So just in the event, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Oh, for sure. So our phone number is 516-867-3580. And we are here basically all the time during normal business hours and beyond often. Um, and then our website is literacynassau.org. So either way. Karen, how far back do you think the the, uh, the real knowledge of, of dyslexia goes? And I'm thinking, like you mentioned, your mother's going to be 80. 
I'm mm-hmm. over the age of your mother. And I don't remember hearing uh, when I was a kid growing up uh, the word. That doesn't mean it didn't exist. It just means I don't remember hearing it. Uh, but I remember when kids did have a problem in school, mm-hmm. um, it would be a different deal. You would have to go for extra help. And, you know, mm-hmm. you kind of had to look at, um, I don't think I did, but I think a lot of people would look at kids who uh, had this kind of problem uh, and and have a real bad stigma back in those days. I mean, so I think if you grew up in that era or even a little later, like mm-hmm. your mother, yeah. and you've gone through almost all your life with that problem, that that's pretty brutal, actually. Uh, it is. It is. You're 100 percent right, Otto. So um, my mom, uh, she was born in 43 and um, in school, she she still vividly remembers one of her first memories was in the second grade. And back then you were called on. I mean, it's a different game today in public schools, but you were called on to recite. So you would stand up and and read aloud or speak aloud when you were talking to the teacher. Right. And she was often called on to read aloud and just there was it just nothing could happen. And so despite the fact that she's a brilliant artist, she's got, I mean, the whole creative side of her brain is on overdrive because of the dyslexia, which I can talk about as well. But um, she was made to feel very stupid as a result. Dyslexia itself, um, I'm not sure exactly when the term became a thing, but back in the day of Sam Orton, which was, like I said, just over a hundred years ago, he was studying um pathways in the brain over time. It was a very like a longitudinal study um, with young children who he had worked with utilizing this kind of Wharton Gillingham approach and seeing how their brains evolved over time. And this was way before functional MRIs existed. This was just based on like observation. So like real deal, nitty gritty science, right? He called it strephosymbolia, which means word blindness. And that's what the terminology was way, way back then. And then Otto, I, dyslexia has been a term that I know has been a thing since there were some landmark cases in the United States in the 1980s. Um, and I think the earliest one was in 1974. Um, uh, there was one that that had gone all the way up to the federal level. And so that's when the term dyslexia really, I think, started to take shape and to take form in the in the conversation of education. The issue is that because education is state funded, each state responds differently to dyslexia as um, as a need of children, right? And so it was only in 2017, the legislation passed in 17 and then came a, a law in 18 that the word dyslexia could be used on an IEP in New York State, 2018. Wow. And that's why it's so important to me that we are doing this work right now. Because what happens is right now, Only the word is allowed to be used. There's no mandate for teacher training. There's none of this is done in public schools in in New York. It some of it is, but mostly public schools are opting not to do it because it's expensive. It's so expensive. And our taxes are already really, really high. Right. So because it's not a mandate and schools don't have to do it at some point, there will be a mandate. And when there is, they're going to scramble to find an organization that can train them. So I want us to be positioned uniquely, especially in Long Island, to go out and train our teachers so that they can properly know how to implement this. Because right now in Massachusetts and Connecticut, the legislation is ahead of where we are in New York, which to me is always surprising because I feel like New York is a really progressive state. But in Massachusetts and Connecticut, things are moving faster than they are here in New York. New York will catch up for sure, but it's just a matter of when. So I want our organization to be positioned to be able to deliver that training when the time comes. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, some people have a problem with math. Yeah. So you have a problem with math, so you get extra help. Me mm-hmm. personally, I one of the things you had was a list of signs was learning a foreign language. Yeah. I could not learn a foreign language. I <laughs> mean, I chopped my way through it, but it just didn't sink in easily. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe I had a mild case. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very common. And it's a spectrum disorder. So lots of people have, you know, a little bit of this or a little bit of that. I know people who like can't get from point A to point B without GPS because they say they're directionally challenged. That's a sign of dyslexia. 
Like Mm -hmm. there's all kinds of little things that, you know, you don't even realize could be pointing to the fact that your brain might have some modicum of it. It's all possible. What age approximately do those kind of neural pathways kind of start to, I want to say close or just not be as, you know, viable anymore for learning in that way? So they're always, they're always available. Let me start by saying they're always available. However, current research will tell you that between the ages of like eight and 10, which is perfect in school, right? Because up to third grade, children are learning to read. And then after when they get to fourth grade and beyond, they are reading to learn, right? So there's a shift there. And it goes from language arts and decoding and spelling to more of like comprehension and, um, you know, understanding like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not intuition, but like um, when questions are overt versus versus being a uh, I'm sorry. I'm having a senior moment. This is fine. This <laughs> That's is okay. Right, we right get it. For this, right? It's okay. We get it. We're, we're family here when it comes okay. to that. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, but it's, so that's when they're reading to learn, right? And so the ideal is if we can, if we can remediate before age 10, we have a better, better chance of a faster success. However, I will say this, and I think this will be interesting for this population because the brain is always available. Orton Gillingham would be extremely effective with victims of stroke. The reason why is because what happens after a stroke, right? Very often, part of our brain is just like, nope, not anymore, right? And you have to relearn all of the things. Think about the therapy that I just described, right? And how we're going to use yesterday's errors to create tomorrow's lesson. Orton Gillingham works very, very much like physical therapy in that way that we would myelinate new brain pathways, starting from sound symbol relationships, which is a very baseline thing to begin from that A says, ah, but it can also say A. And in some circumstances, it says A, uh, depending on where it's at in a word, right? And you teach that and you illustrate it with samples and you give the student the opportunity to absorb the information that you're saying for that day. Repeat, 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 right? And then that's how neural pathways are created. So the same way that you can reteach an, an older person who's had a stroke how to lift their hand up through physical therapy, you can reteach an older brain how to read. So I will not say that the neural pathway is closed because they don't. It's okay. just, you know, it's a challenge. It's, you know, every age presents its own set of challenges. So what's cool about working with adults, because I have I have done Orton-Gillingham remediation with adults. Adults understand because they have life experience. So I can say like, hey, picture you're driving a car, right? Like if the car, if something is coming towards the car, you're going to swerve a little bit, right? To get out of the way. That's kind of what we're going to do here. Like if we know that X, Y, and Z is particularly challenging, we're just going to find a way around it and we're going to go a different way. So there are things that you can teach an older person faster because they have the benefit of life experience to use as context where little ones, you know, you're just trying to get them to stop spinning in the chair sometimes. (laughs) You know, I actually have a friend who's in a home. She's an older lady, but her two Mm -hmm. daughters are paying out of pocket for speech therapy for this woman who did have a stroke. Yep. I can't tell you that I know what level of success they've had, mm-hmm. but it, it is interesting that they think it's important enough to do it. Um, you know, if you can't communicate, uh, That's what's it. life all about if you get right down to it? You know, exactly. it's pretty difficult, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think about like babies, right? Like babies up to 18 months or so, they, they can't communicate their needs, right? And they're spending the whole first 18 months of their lives just listening. And then they say their first few words, right? Like you get mama, dada, and a couple of other things. But because that's how language is acquired, it's acquired first through listening. Those 18 months are super frustrating, right? Because I want to say, my diaper's wet. Can you change me? But I don't have words and I don't have the ability to write. So I just have to do what? Scream and cry until you figure it out. The now, same frustration exists for folks with dyslexia at all ages. Right? When you said when you said my diaper is wet, did you worry about how you grammatically said that? I have a big problem with how we teach languages in this country. And that well, when I took the German, the mm-hmm. first thing they started was the grammar. Yeah. I didn't learn how to speak English with grammar. They mm-hmm. straighten that out later. Uh, right. So I don't get it, you know. <laughs> Well, we we introduce grammar usually, at least I do when I'm teaching. I introduce grammar when I introduce suffixes, 
So once I go from one syllable words to like one syllable words with suffixes attached, I talk about, you know, parts of speech, noun, verb, adverb, and adjective, and how the part of speech will shift based on the, uh, the suffix that you add on. So for example, you use the word jump, right? And jump, we know what that is, right? But if I'm jumping, I'm doing it now. So it becomes a present tense verb, right? If he or she jumps, that's a third person, um, a third person verb, right? If, uh, if we are jumpy, then it's an adjective, right? Because we're feeling jumpy, right? If we jumped, we did it before. So it's a past tense verb. So like all the different pieces of the grammar can shift, but I don't teach that until I teach suffixes. That usually happens about 50 or 60 hours in. Good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, well, I'm a little on. jumpy, I'm <laughs> just saying, but uh, um, it's really, it's it's an amazing program. And um, what's, I want to say what, what's someone to expect when they contact you so you know you have all this wonderful information and 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 like who usually contacts you is it a person an older person who who might be you know in need of it you know when when people don't have dyslexia and for whatever reason they got to the place in life where you know they didn't learn how to read um, you know, it's, it's like, again, the stigma, we talk so much about stigma, you, you know, especially as we get older, you know, it's like, you know, it's like a disease getting older, mm -hmm. um, even though it really isn't. Right. So how do you get the word out about this program? Cause it's so wonderful and it's good to know that you can learn these things. And, and for somebody who is older i know I'm, I'm i'm like going all over the place like but these are just here. i'm just trying to file them away <laughs> right so like for the person who is older who does have life experience you know there is i guess a different way that they would learn to read or write i mean do you go through the alphabet and the sounds the same way so i'm kind of like curious how it it happens how you know what happens like for people that might actually be listening Sure. Okay. I'm going to try and get to every single one of those questions. There's so many. <laughs> I here. jumped around, but that's okay. So the first thing you asked was, um, how do people get in touch with us? Or like, why do people get in touch with us? So I want to make sure that I'm super clear when I say this, because we've been talking all about dyslexia this whole time, right? Right. But the most, the bulk of people who get in touch with us are English language learners, right? Like the bulk of them are adults who are here from another country who really want to learn how to speak and listen to English first so that they can communicate and then read and write. So that's the work we do in the libraries. That's the work we're doing out in the community. And so a lot of times people will um, get in touch with us for our student registrations. I want to interject one quick question. So <laughs> if it's their, if English is going to be their, you know, second language, how many different languages are you guys kind of prepped to translate? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're not really super prepped to translate. I'm not going to lie. We, okay. we do the best we can. And thank God for Google, right? Because Google Translate is a really super huge help. <laughs> um, but yeah, we I mean, we see languages just like we see in neighborhoods, right? You know, you're in the town of North Hempstead. So it depends on what neighborhood you're in is what language you're going to find. If you're over in Westbury, it's going to be a whole lot different than if you're in Great Neck, right? We know what we see based on the the based on the area where we are, what languages we're gonna come across. And that's fine. We ask that when folks come to us to register that they try and bring an English speaker with them to translate. Usually that's a child, which is kind of funny. Right. But um, but so we take the information and we register folks for classes. We run new student registration four times a year. The program is completely free and it's volunteer driven. And so a lot of the folks that we end up getting through Project Independence are um, folks who are older who have retired from teaching or from other, you know, professions where they feel like they can be helpers in the community to teach another adult how to read, write, and speak English. We train them, right? We offer the training that's necessary in order to show an adult how to become an adult literacy tutor. So sometimes folks will come to the saying like, hey, I recently retired and I'm interested in doing something meaningful in my community do you have something for me? And the answer to that is almost always yes, right? And we'll encourage them to come to an orientation training and to a tutor training workshop where we can give them the tools necessary to then pair them with an adult learner um, or a small group of adult learners. We do a lot of small group work now because that seems to be more efficient. Um, okay, so that was part of your question. And as far as the kids and families are concerned, 
there's a, just a wide network out on social media about like what's being done for kids with dyslexia and like dyslexia in the schools and all the legislation and like all of that. A lot of times, some of the kids that we see are lawsuit kids. That's what I call them because that's really what it is, where the family is suing the school district because the child is X years old and can't read and they're spending a significant amount of money to let the school district know that this is not okay. And then we get a phone call. And sometimes we provide services in school. Sometimes we'll do after school. It just depends on the case. Um, and parents talk, man. If you are a parent of a special needs child, you are you are connected. The parents, I'm a parent. We talk, right? So word of mouth is a really huge way in which we get referrals and folks who come to us. Um, I feel like there was more to that question. I don't remember what it was. So that, what, else, what else did you want to yeah, know? So you know, just <laughs> just when an adult goes through their entire life with, oh, with right. not, you know, dyslexia per se, but not mm-hmm. reading or writing. No problem. Well, so um, if you go through your life with dyslexia, you're going to have problems with reading and writing. That's right. kind of like a hand in hand. And right. so folks will hear about us a lot of times from libraries and then they'll contact the library and the library will tell them to contact us. We funnel them into new student registration, the same as the ESL folks, right? So they can come and they can sit and and we will do some testing, just some very baseline testing to see what the deficiencies are and like where a tutor would need to start with this particular individual. Um, And typically the adults who have some signs of dyslexia or learning disability are folks who we would put in a one-on-one situation with a tutor. So, um, so all through the libraries for the most part, but then they contact us. Okay. All right. Oh, perfect timing. Cause now we're going to take a break. Um, you're listening to project independence in you community talk radio on 88.1 FM and WC wp.org. We will be right back with Karen Michike, who is the executive director of Literacy Nassau. Take WCWP with you wherever you go with the WCWP app. Listen live 24-7 to all of our streams, all from one app. Plus, call the studios directly from the app and visit our social media. Download the app through the iOS app store on Apple devices or the Google Play store on Android by searching WCWP Radio or visit WCWP.org for links. The WCWP app, available now on iOS and Android devices. And welcome back to Project Independence and You, Community Talk Radio on 88.1 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. I'm Rebecca Miller, along with Otto Lose and Christina Liu, Dan Cox. We've been speaking with Karen Michike, and I can't believe time is going so fast, but um, you also have uh, a fascinating story to tell us as an author. And But before we get into that, I just am so curious to know how you got to be where you are with Literacy Nassau. Hmm. Um, so I majored in English in college because I don't like to take tests. Um, and I have always loved to read, which is so ironic, right? Considering that my mom is dyslexic. Um, I'm an only child. So I used to read for fun all the time. Um, and I grew up in the eighties and like, I don't know, we didn't have cable TV until like I was in the fifth or sixth grade. So like the, you know, the options of what you could look at on a screen were kind of limited. When I graduated from college, I became an English teacher for like a hot minute, like really like two years. I was leave replacement. All the pregnant ladies came back and then I was out of a job. Um, And then I went into nonprofit work um, at the Cross Island YMCA on Hillside Avenue. I worked there for six years, first as their teen director, then their uh, senior program director. I ran their camps, their after school. Like I just worked with kids. I was, I liked kids and I was good with kids. Um, And then I went on to be the executive director of a boys and girls club in Long Island City. And then I met my husband, right? And like all things, he was a teacher and I was doing all this after school and summer stuff. And we're like, hmm, if we're ever going to have like a relationship or a family, it would be really nice if we could see each other. So one of us had to shift our employment situation and uh, he was the one with the pension. So I made that. <laughs> so I found this great job at Literacy Now. So I had never heard of them before. I said, this is cool. This marries my love of English and my love of language with my nonprofit management experience. And at the time, it was all adults, right? I said, if I have a baby and my baby is sick and you can't read and you're a grown person, you can wait until tomorrow and I can go take care of my baby. And that was the kind of job that I wanted. Um so I came here and the rest is history. That was 13 years ago. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's been a while. Yep. 
Uh, uh, just to backtrack for a minute, your experience, all of what you just described, is a luxury that most older people don't have about with their children. You know, their their daughter is not the executive director of Literacy Nassau. Mm -hmm. How, what's the best way, like my view is that the person who has this problem, who, who could be in their 70s or whatever, may not be the one who is going to activate uh, anything. Uh, so I'm, what I'm saying is if anybody's listening, people who are family members, uh, you know, pay attention to your aunt or uh, an older cousin or your mother or your grandmother or whoever who has a problem like this. Is that, I mean, a lot of times, is it a family member who gets involved? Yeah, almost always. Um, it's very hard for um, folks to advocate for themselves just generally, right? Because of what I said about social anxiety and stuff, the first step is like admitting that something is wrong. And that's really hard for adults to do. So if you know that like your mom or your sister or your aunt or whomever has a situation and needs some help, even if we can't provide the one-on-one -on -one tutoring that they need, let's say that they're homebound or that there's, you know, that there are other circumstances that make it not possible for us to help, we can still be a resource. And we know so much about the, about the industry and about what's going on out there in the field and can connect them to someone who could potentially be of great help to them. So definitely give us a call, you know, yeah, look out for your family members for sure, but give us a call or, or check us out on the web and um, we're all readily available and eager to share this knowledge with the community because it's so important and it can change a life. Like really and truly, if you learn how to read, you change someone's life. So yeah, I, I was happy to hear, frankly, that Project Independence refers people uh, to you, yeah. um, which is another reason why people should not be hesitant to uh, contact Project Independence, uh, because this is just another example uh, of what can come out of it. Um, you know, it's a matter of the person, the social worker, nurse goes to see somebody, talks to somebody, they see they have needs, and mm -hmm. they can guide them through a, a very complex system for things like literacy and all kinds of other things. So that's just a little commercial for Project Independence, but uh, it's a fact. Definitely. One other question, all right? I, there was an article that I read that was in a newspaper back in that Great Neck thing, I think, a, a couple of years ago. And in that article, it was indicated that at that time, you had 500 volunteers and 1,000 students. These are big numbers to me. Uh, how do you manage that, you know, and how do you manage to get 500 volunteers and, and handle a thousand students? That's, that's not little stuff. That's a, that's a job. You're right. <laughs> it is yeah. a job. Um, Otto, I will say that number has shifted tremendously since COVID, um, unfortunately, and um, volunteerism took a gigantic hit during the pandemic. Um, especially among the elderly population. See, we, we're in a very unique situation. We rely on retired folks predominantly to be our volunteers, right? But then we have other people of all ages who are our students. So we really run the spectrum now of children through older adult as far as our service population is concerned, because we're, you know, even if we're having you on as a volunteer, we're still serving you in that way. We're giving you something meaningful to do. We're giving you purpose. We're, you know, giving you a job, something, you know, to kind of hold on to, which is, a, that's got a huge purpose in my mind. Um, and when COVID happened, the, the older population was so vulnerable that we lost so many people. Also, all of our work was done live back then, right? So we were meeting in and, and doing the volunteer work in libraries, and libraries shuttered for a long, long time, right? And then as they reopened, there are mandates and things like this, and older adults want to make sure that they stay safe, and of course, rightfully so. Um, and so in the meantime, we had shifted most of the work we're doing to virtual platforms. And I don't know about you guys, but a lot of older adults are really uncomfortable with technology. So we have that as an issue as well. So we are now in more of a rebuilding phase as far as our volunteer population is concerned, because we are always looking for more volunteers. But as a result of all of that, we have heavily relied upon the group model for our ESL instruction because we no longer can really serve in a one-on-one -on -one capacity. 
We just don't have enough volunteers to do that. So the numbers for students have remained high and the students were more than fine with shifting to virtual when, you know, when it was a pandemic and things like that. But now that things are coming back to being live again, we, we do, we have more students coming in, we have, you know, greater need. And so we really do want more volunteers to sign up, to come and hang out with us. Now you train the volunteers, I assume. Of course. What, what's involved with that in case somebody's listening? Who, uh... It's um usually to work with the adult ESL population. We train for about three hours. We provide curriculum for it. So it's very, like I said about the box, like we'll give you a box, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, like that. That's what we do. Um, we make it as easy and um, as hands-on as possible. We provide support. We explain about the program, the history, the mission, how we get our students um, and what a class looks like. And then they meet at libraries um, once or twice a week for a couple of hours at a time. And they deliver the curriculum. Like we're so good, we even make the copies for them. So like, here's your packet for this week. This is what you need. All you really need to have as an adult, um, you know, as a volunteer is the ability to drive here once in a while if you want us to do the copies for you so you can pick up your copies um, and to get to the library, you know, consistently over the course of a 12 week session, because most of our um, most of our work with ESL folks is 12 weeks long. Well, the ESL is a, it has its same problems as dyslexia for people who don't shift into, a, you know, learning the language. So. Mm -hmm. um, it it greatly cuts down what they can do, in yes. my opinion. It's all, so, it's all universal. Mm -hmm. yeah. it all, there's yeah. a very common themes throughout all the work that we do, 100%. Interesting. It's all good work. Thank very you. good. A lot of information, a lot of good stuff. Um, we're so glad to have you here as a guest. And uh, over before our first um, first few minutes of the show, we were learning a little bit about Karen and that you have a book coming out. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit about that and what the process was like to write this book. Sure. Um, so ever since I was little, I loved to read, right? And I read beachy stuff, light, easy, fun. Like I'm not trying to be a brainiac on my free time, right? Um, and so I had to go back to school to get a master's degree in order to get to the fellow level of Orton Gillingham. So that's the first thing you should know. I had to go back. And it turned out that through the Orton Gillingham Academy, you could go back and get your master's in anything you wanted. So I was like, okay, I just have to have a master's. It could be in business. It could be in science. It could be in anything. And I was like, I want to get it in writing because I've always dreamed of being an author. Like that was like the big, you know, mega star thing in my childhood. Right. And so um, I went to I went back to school. I went to Fairfield University for the MFA program, which is a low residency model. So I was able to work full time and be here. And then I would travel to Connecticut um, for like 18 days a year. It wasn't a whole lot. And then I would do all independent study work in my first semester. I completed my first manuscript and my mentor was like, this is a lot and very, very fast. And also it's really good. So we have like kind of an anomaly on our hands. Like there's, this seems very natural for you. And I loved it. And so then I said, well, I have a manuscript. I might as well start querying agents, right? Let's see if we can find a literary agent to represent this manuscript and get it out in the world. Well, that didn't happen. I did, I tried and I queried tons of people. I learned all about the industry and I didn't get represented. So the second semester I wrote another novel tried again, third semester, another novel, tried again. And in the fourth semester, I was starting to get frustrated. I was like, this is my last semester of my master's. How do I not have an agent yet? This is ridiculous. I've written three books. And I was writing like heavier women's fiction. So lesson two, you all, if you are looking to become a writer, everything is about timing, right? So heavy women's fiction, mix that with the pandemic, not a good mix, right? Nobody wants to read like heavy, sad, dramatic, like we're working through our daddy issues stuff during a pandemic. That is not the right time. So I was getting a little frustrated and I said, forget it. I'm going to write a comedy, right? I'm just going to write a romantic comedy, which is what I love. I think it's so funny and good and whatever. Anyway, long story short, we end up with this. This is my book. It's called The Book Proposal. It got a start review from Publishers Weekly. I'm super excited about it. Um, it was my first attempt at writing comedy and it is soaring. I'm super excited. Um, I was able to get a literary agent with this manuscript. Um, she submitted it to one round of, you know, being out on sub. And I got um, a publisher within 12 days for a three book deal. 
on like my very first tryout, which is really exciting. So this is my first book. It's coming out with Sourcebooks. It'll be out on May 16th and you can get it in Barnes and Noble, Amazon, anywhere that you buy books, it will be available. It's available for pre-order now. You will notice that my name on this book is not Karen because this is not a popular time to be a Karen. So instead it's KJ Michike because that is just way more cute and fun than having to be associated with my regrettable government name. Um, but it's a really fun book. It's about a romance author. So it's metafiction. It's about a romance author who is having a tough time finding her own happily ever after. And so she gets a little drunk at a, at a night out at the club and emails her high school crush and is surprised when he writes back. And so it's the story of what happens after that and all the chaos that ensues. And it's really, really fun, light, easy, silly read. So I hope you pick it up because... It's exciting for me. Wow. So it's a three book deal. Like, is that, is there a time period where you have to kick out another two novels? How yes, does that my, work? My second book is coming out in March of 24 and my third book is expected in uh, January of 25. So the second book has already been written. Um, that one's called A Storybook Wedding. Um, all of these are like books about writers because that's what they signed me for. That's okay. what I'm doing. So book in the title? Yeah, for the most part, I think there will be book in the title of all three. I don't know what the third one holds yet, but I think it's going to be called The Book Baby, but we'll see. Um, and yeah, like if you like Emily Henry, for example, you will love this. This is very much on par with Emily Henry. Does. Is there a website like a KJ yes, Michikai? Yeah. Yes, kjmichikai.net. So it's the same horrific spelling that you see on your screen. K J. M I C C I C H E dot net. And all of the information is on there. I'm doing lots of events and Tory type stuff later in the season um, to get this book out into the hands of readers. And it's got, like I said, great reviews. Publishers Weekly gave it a star review, which is a big deal for a debut. And also, Library Journal um, is also gave it a great star review. So that's exciting. And uh, sounds like it's going to be a great book club book, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. um, really does. And we have a book club here. So we'll I'll, I'll try to like, you know, I know I know someone here, I could maybe get that book in there. We'll we'll talk to them about it. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, want, you know, miss the, the website or the phone numbers, you can always call 311 or 516-869-6311. And, um, you know, just c connect with Christine or myself, and we'll be happy to give you any of the contact information that um, you may have missed. Well, it's it's so exciting to have, you know, the author. And what what about any, anything else? Anything else brewing from the book? Like, uh, I don't know, a movie? Yes. Uh, I, have, I have a film agent, which is exciting. And he, um, the last email I got said that he had gotten some interest from the Netflix book to film people. I don't know. When I get an email like that, I'm like, that's really cool, right? That's really, but, yeah, but that is really cool. Right now. Like right now, that is literally nothing. But, you know, maybe it will become something. When I when I talked to him on the, I had a Zoom with him a couple of weeks ago, he was asking me like, who would you envision as Gracie? Like, who are your acting preferences and stuff like right. that? So that was really kind of fun to answer those questions and give a, give a picture in his mind of what it could look like on screen. So, so. how proud are your daughters of mom? Oh my gosh, especially my older daughter, Haley. She gets it, I think, because I, I really worked so hard with her to remediate her dyslexia and to show her that like, look, like you can be whatever you want to be if you really work hard at any age. Because remember to them, they're 10 and nine. I'm old, right? To them. And like the world, I don't really feel like I'm that old, but like in my house, I'm old. And, um, and I showed them, look, look, mommy is like, dinosaur and still she's kidding look, <laughs> look what you can do they're like you know being being an author and like doing all the things and so I think it's really powerful for my girls especially with a learning disability to know that like you can do whatever you right want. right really cool. so I'm grateful I'm so blessed and grateful 100%. the only limits are in your imagination that's right how's that that's exactly that's, um, mm -hmm. yeah um, it's wonderful. And, uh, you know, and, and kudos, I'm sure everybody in your family is, is proud of you. Um, it's really, it's really wonderful. I mean, and all this success and, you know, continuing with literacy NASA, I mean, how many hours a week are you kind of working with literacy? Is it, is it 24 seven? Is it 
Yeah. So uh, yes, I, I get to work every day around seven o'clock in the morning. I have a treadmill right here behind this computer. Um, and I work out as soon as I get in, cause I need the endorphins to like get me going. Um, I try and write in the morning when I can for a couple of hours and then I work and I have to shift myself into different modes all day long. I usually don't walk in my house at night until between six 30 and seven. So I'm usually out of the house. I live down the block, so it's close, you know, there's right, not like right. a need- usually out of the house about 11 to 12 hours a day. And I can, I can really only write here. I don't write well at home because my kids can't pretend I'm not there. Um, and so, uh, so I do everything here and it's a lot, but it's okay. It's, it's exciting. It's a, yeah. I feel like it's a really special time in my life right now. And, and it won't always be this way, but it is for now. So I'm excited. Well, I mean, one of the one of the themes we talk a lot about on Project Independence and you um, is you're never too old Mm-mm. to start something new, even if you've never done it. So, right. I mean, I'm sure you're not near the ages here. Maybe Christina, closer to Christina's age than um, than Otto and I. But um, it's so Definitely great. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so actually, uh, um, you know, when thank you so much for joining us, it's time to go um, to another break. And then we come back with uh, Talk of the Town with Christina Liu. But I want to thank you, Karen, so much for joining us. All this information is amazing. And we wish you so much luck with all these endeavors and your continued support of, you know, Literacy Nassau is just wonderful. 